we're at an interesting point in time here in the retirement plan landscape where we're seeing more and more the need to ensure that we have thoughtful fiduciaries building the right plans that serve both their organizational needs and their employees' needs. But at the same time, we have a more complex regulatory system. We have recent statutory change. We have more and more success from plaintiff's firms that has served to increase the risk in the overall environment. So as a result of that, we appreciate you coming to talk with us today and so that we can discover ways and, and identify ways for you as fiduciaries to navigate some of those challenges. And frankly, you being here is a critical first step because it demonstrates your willingness and interest in becoming educated on these topics. And then hopefully you'll take some of these topics back to your committees and your colleagues, and we can get even more mileage out of our conversation today. You've got our entire team with you today. I'm Matthew Eichmann, our National Retirement Practice Leader, joined by some other names and faces that many of you know very well. I'm Scott Liggett, our Director of ERISA Oversight, uh, Chuck Smith, our Nebraska Retirement Practice Leader, and Mike Smoots as ERISA Counsel. And I think the way that we're going to conduct our conversation today is in an attempt to be very conversational. Um, certainly, there are a lot of opportunities for you to receive, whether it be our newsletter, our news alerts, or other people's published pieces that allow you to read about these things. But we want to talk about these items today. We want to talk about your responsibilities to monitor your record keepers and to be aware of cybersecurity risks. We want to dive into the Secure 2.0 grab bag and talk about the key elements that we think will be on your mind and will be there for you to be able to put to use, whether it's this year or the following year. We have some guidance around emergency savings accounts and um, we have some statistics demonstrating the need for emergency savings and then talk about the various ways to solve for those needs. Some recent independent contractor rule developments that we think you'll find interesting and then kind of a catch-all category at the end and this is where we're going to give you some highlights from a litigation perspective in particular that we think will be really important for you to keep in mind as we move forward. But as I mentioned up front, we want to start by talking about cybersecurity risks and this is something that's probably important to each of you within your own organizations. You're probably keenly aware that particularly post pandemic, as more and more information moves electronically, and as those potential data thieves have become more creative and more confident, the risks to your employees' data in their retirement plans are greater than they have ever been before. And this is a fiduciary issue. You may not have known that or you may not think that that would be a fiduciary issue but you know the department of labor has told us that it is and and i think as a starting point let's go to scott and scott why don't you talk to us about the department of labor's perspective and then maybe share a little bit about what you're doing with clients and what we've done as a firm for our clients in that regard Matthew, I've, this is Mike. Um, we might be having a little technical difficulty here. Can you hear me? I can hear you okay, Mike. Um, we seem to have lost Scott, but I'm going to try to unmute Scott here. Scott, let's uh, try it again. Hello there. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. I, and and I whatever you said while you were muted, it was <laughs> brilliant. So mm -hmm. go ahead and repeat that, and then we can go on down the road here. Well, my only brilliance was hello, everyone. Uh, Yes, as, as Matthew said, uh, you know, in the past we, we've touched on cybersecurity issues on this platform and other attorney talks, and have discussed, you know, the issues and challenges. And these attacks, you know, have stayed in the headlines. Last year, for example, you know, there was a wave of cyber attacks and data breaches related to a company called MoveIt, um, and it's a managed file transfer software company that uh, impacted thousands of companies and uh, over 100 million people uh, worldwide. And then late last year, another example, uh, there was cyber attacks on a business processing firm called In Infosys. And that impacted non-qualified planned service platforms for a census and Newport group, which resulted in, in basically those platforms being shut down for a number of weeks. And then the list goes on. So. 
you know, here at QPA, we are always, you know, looking at ways where uh, we could be doing more to try to help plan sponsors manage these duties to monitor. And, um, and what we really need to do is go back to, you know, the DOL guidance. Um, so as we talk about on this slide, you know, back in April of 2021, uh, the DOL issued, you know, really three pieces of guidance. The first being the tips for hiring a service provider, you know, which gave guidance on, you know, what a uh, plan sponsor should be doing when they're looking at selecting a service provider and what's involved there. Um, the cyber, they issued cybersecurity program best practices, which was intended, you know, to assist plan fiduciaries with those responsibilities. And I'll come back to that one here in a minute, because uh, that's very broad. And then lastly, uh, you know, it, they issued online security tips to help participants with, you know, basic rules to help reduce the risk of, uh, risk of any type of online fraud and loss. And so I want to take a minute on the cybersecurity program best practices. And on the next slide, you'll see um, that understandably, you know, the term best practices is very broad. And you know, plan sponsors, you know, need help and assistance carrying out, you know, these requirements. And in fact, the uh, best practices, you know, set out 12 separate focus areas and it covers five pages. So very broad and inclusive. And so at QPA, what we've done under Matthew's uh, guidance and, and through our QPA department, we took a proactive approach and reached out to uh, the various re retirement plan record keepers and issued a cybersecurity questionnaire request for information, an RFI. And you know, in efforts to help uh, ensure that the record keeper that you all are using um, has been implementing the tips and best practices re recommended by the Department of Labor. So we at QPA reached out to, uh, I believe we work with about 16 different record keepers, issued these questionnaires, and they've all responded to those. And so people say, okay, well, what should we be doing then? And on the next slide, we talk about, um, you know, taking that information, you know, so one of the first things I recommend is if you do work with QPA, request that your advisor, you know, uh, goes over your record keepers responses with the committees. And uh, I feel equally important is that you also share it with your uh, IT personnel, as well as any outside auditors, as you know, more and more focus and attention comes to um, cybersecurity across you know all reaches of, of your company's uh, practices and, and your business and so outside audit firms are very interested in what you're doing and your IT personnel can really help you you know go through the responses uh, that the record keepers um, gave to us and then we passed on to you so if you work with QPA make sure your advisor is is reviewing uh, those RFI responses for your applicable record keeper. And be sure your, com your uh, committee minutes reflect that review that you undertook, because that's very, very important and demonstrates your oversight uh, that, that you're undertaking to, to work in this area. Um, another thing that, that I recommend is, you know, periodically consider businesses change, your practices change, your processes change over time. And, uh, I think it's important to periodically evaluate, you know, whether your internal um, processes uh, present any unique cybersecurity risks and, and document that type of periodic review. You know, we talked about this some um, uh, before uh, with COVID, you know, so many more employees now work remotely. And, you know, has that, has that caused any, you know, sensitive data to be, handled differently or have you changed your processes on how you're handling you know, your retirement plan data? So I think it's important to, from time to time, take a look and see if there are any unique risks that are being challenges. Um, then lastly, and I, I worked with a client on this uh, just yesterday, uh, you know, review your company's cybersecurity insurance coverage. Um, and as part of that, 
make your underwriter aware of the steps that you've been taking, such as uh, having this RFI go out to your record keeper and keep them aware um, as it goes towards your liability coverage, you know, in this area. And cybersecurity uh, insurance coverages are, you know, becoming more and more focused, uh, more and more specific. And, and it, uh, you know, I think it'd be valuable to take some time and, and see where your coverage sits today and if there's any improvements you need to make with that. And hey, Chuck, that, I, I know that I know that you spend a fair amount of time talking about cybersecurity with your clients. You know, is there anything you either want to accentuate and echo from, from what Scott shared or anything you want to add to his comments so that we can ensure everybody listening understands the, the significance of this particular issue? Yeah, I guess one thing I would just point out is that no one's expecting you to be a technology expert here. Um, you're, most of you probably are in HR benefits and technology is, is is something in the periphery that you have to deal with. But we're in the same boat as advisors, right? We're either investment advisors or risk attorneys. Um, and so we're not technology experts either. But if you go through this process, I think that's the important step. Going through the process, and as Scott said, incorporating the technology group of your employer, um, of your of your company, are critical. And so therefore, I don't think you need to be intimidated by this. Um, it's very digestible, and we've framed it in a way that um, really covers all of your bases and gives you a lot of um, uh, security as far as that you're covering your responsibilities as a fiduciary. Yeah, that's I appreciate that. That's helpful. I think to maybe relax a little bit of nerves um, that we otherwise could feel like you know everyone involved is expected to become an expert. It really is about working through the process. And maybe I'll add one practical comment as well. We developed that RFI by looking to two big categories of sources. One of those is indeed the tips and the best practices from the Department of Labor. So we went through and we grabbed the specific questions out of there that the Department of Labor says you should be asking. But then we also saw that the Department of Labor had already revised its audit protocol so that it began to ask questions about cybersecurity on audit. And we borrowed some of those questions and put those into the RFI. So from a practical perspective, if any of you find yourselves on audit with the Department of Labor and they ask questions about cybersecurity, or maybe even if your auditor is beginning to ask more questions, reach out to our firm, reach out to your advisor firm or your advisor team, and they can get you some of the answers to those questions so that we can save you some time in that context. Okay, so I think that the cybersecurity is an issue that we know impacts you know, many businesses in many ways, including their retirement plans. This is a good time for us to transition over into talking about Secure 2.0. And as many people probably remember from many of our prior conversations, on the heels of Secure 2.0 becoming final on December 29th of 2022, the IRS said, hey, we're going to give you a grab bag style of guidance that'll probably be question and answer format. And they told us throughout 2023 that they would get that out in the fall. Well, we got through October and we got through November and we got into December and we hadn't seen it quite yet. And then actually when they issued the guidance in December, I checked the calendar and found out that they issued it on the very last day of fall. So a big thank you to the IRS for hitting that fall target and providing us some practical guidance on a handful of topics that we are all really kind of thinking, hey, this is interesting, but what can we do about it without more guidance? And so we put a lot of that just here on one chart. We wanna talk about these kind of one at a time. Uh, Chuck, let's start with you. Let's talk a little bit about mandatory automatic enrollment. Maybe you can share with us the aspects of this that you find particularly interesting, maybe before the grab bag, and then also what the grab bag seeks to clarify for us. Yeah, I think we should just uh, go back and as a reminder of what this provision is. Um, so basically in that SECURE Act, 2.0, it put in a requirement that all new plans or plans that establish a, a, an elective deferral provision, a 401k option, after the date of the act, December 29, 2022, are going to have to have automatic enrollment beginning next year and or automatic escal escalation to get up to 10% of deferrals. Um, but they put, so it's only effective for plans adopted after December 29, 2022. So plans adopted before that are 
quote unquote grandfathered and do not have to have that provision in their plan. Um, there's been a lot of questions or concerns about, well, what happens in a transaction situation where one or two plans are coming together or splitting apart? Um, and the IRS gave some guidance on those specific issues that I think are kind of interesting as we, so anytime you're working through a merger or an acquisition, have these in the back of your mind, reach out to your advisor um, so we can, or your record keeper, so we can walk through exactly what the implications are. And it's sort of, there, there's a lot of nuances to this, but the long and short of it is, the first thing they gave, the answer was a, was a pretty much a give me. If you've got two plans that are grandfathered, they were both adopted before December 29, 2022 and are not subject to these automatic enrollment and auto escalation provisions, just because you merge those two plans, you don't all of a sudden become subject to those new rules. Um, both plans that were grandfathered will continue on not being subject to these new automatic enrollment, mandatory automatic enrollment and auto escalation rules. Now, it's different, though, if one plan has was grandfathered and one is not, so one before 2022 and one after. And in that case, it's typically going to be whichever is the surviving plan. So if a plan, a newer plan established after 20, December 29th and does, is going to have to have automatic enrollment by next year up to 6%, and another plan is merged into it, a grandfathered plan is merged into it, you're going to have to have um, automatic enrollment at 6% uh, auto escalation up to 10. If the re if you do the reverse and a newer plan is merged into a, an older grandfathered plan, um, then it is possible that it will you will be able to remove that provision and no longer have automatic un enrollment. And those are the two bullet points there. One, that the surviving plan is the historical plan, the grandfathered plan, and two, that they were part of a transaction that created a control group. Um, and they basically give you a time period, uh, it's codified under section 410, which is the date of the merger or transaction that made you a control group and the year after. So if you do a merger within that time frame, you're able to continue on with the grandfathered planned requirement that basically does not require you to have automatic enrollment and auto escalation from six to, six to 10%. And I think maybe, you know, Chuck, a couple of interesting aspects of that is, first of all, there were a lot of people who thought that Secure 2.0 said automatic enrollment is now mandatory. And you made it very clear that it's not mandatory for everybody. It's essentially required for new plans that are created on or after the date of Secure 2.0. And then the second aspect of this is you get into that merger context. The answers are probably what we thought they would be or at a minimum what we hoped they would be. They're, yep. they're pretty commonsensical in how they work as far as what the surviving plan is and whether it was subject or is subject to the new rules or is grandfathered in under the old rules. You know, perhaps one context that'll become more and more interesting to people would be the, the impact of these rules for PEPs or pooled employer plans. And I don't know, Chuck, if there's anything within the PEP context that you'd want to clarify. Yeah, they did actually provide guidance on that as well. Um, and so if you were a, a, uh, an employer going into a pooled employer plan or a, a multiple employer plan, um, you would be subject to these new rules, even if the PEP or the multiple employer plan was established prior to 2022 and his grandfather. So you would basically have a plan where some of the employers are subject to these new rules and some of the employers aren't. Now, another big aspect of both Secure 1.0 and Secure 2.0 is really trying to increase coverage. So if anybody were to ask you, hey, what's the main purpose of these two big congressional acts? The answer is Congress would like to see more people in retirement plans. And so you can see listed on the screen and in front of you that, you know, one of the provisions within Secure 2.0 is to provide more startup credits or credits to employers for starting up new plans. And Chuck, I wonder if maybe you could clarify some of the details around the startup credits that were addressed within the grab bag. Yeah, I don't think this one's too complicated. It's, it's summarized there that any employer with 100 employees or less is, is eligible for these for tax credits for startup costs um, and eligible up to $1,000 per employee um, employer contribution credit. Um, the point of clarification from this notice was really about um, what if an employer is over 100 and then 
dips below 100 in a subsequent year. Um, so we may have employers who are on this call and, and whether it's part of a, a divestiture of one of their assets, one of their companies, um, and they, they're, for example, at 120 employees when their plan was adopted or could have been years ago, and now they dip under 100, uh, the rule is very clear uh, that you have to have under 100 employees when the plan was adopted and in the year in which you want to take those credits. So there's no ability to, you know, change your demographics and all of a sudden become eligible for the startup credit. Uh, I want to talk about the third one on this list, and then uh, Chuck, I'll probably go back to you on the Roth employer contributions. Um, you see a reference here in front of you, everybody, to these de minimis financial incentives. And as a, as a general rule, there's this thing called the exclusive benefit rule that tells plan sponsors and plan fiduciaries um, that there are really limited ways in which you can incentivize people to participate in plans. Matching contributions would be a clear way in which you can permissibly encourage people to participate in plans. But prior to Secure 2.0, uh, the law prevented plan sponsors from providing you know, cash amounts or gift cards or other types of financial incentives to get people enrolled. And, and as I mentioned earlier, Congress really wants more people in plans. And so it put into Secure 2.0 this provision that says, hey, it is now an exception to the exclusive benefit rule to provide them these de minimis financial incentives. And it actually referenced gift cards, not as the only way to do it, but as a specific example way to do it. And so when we got the, the law in December of 2022 and we waited throughout most of last year to figure out what de minimis meant, a lot of us assumed that the IRS would come in maybe at $50, but more likely probably at a $100 level and say, hey, you plan sponsor, if you want to incentivize somebody to get into the plan, you can give them a gift card of up to $100. Well, we were pleasantly surprised in December when the grab bag said that amount actually could be up to $250 in value. And that's higher than the way that the IRS has interpreted the term de minimis in almost any other context. And so that's a good thing. That says that you know, starting now, if any of you as employers would like to encourage your people to participate in the plan, you can give them financial incentives outside the plan to get them to roll in the plan. Now there's a couple of important limitations or practical points on how to use this. One is, as you can see in front of you, this is only for employees who have no deferral election in effect. So it's not about the people who are already in the plan and getting them to stay in the plan, but instead, it has to be people who do not have a deferral election in place before you provide that incentive. Now, secondly, and thankfully, the IRS confirmed that you could spread that value out over time to encourage and incentivize the people to remain in the plan. So at its simplest, you could give somebody $100 to, to start in the plan, and you could say, if you're still in the plan a year from now, you'll get another $100. You notice my total did not add up to 250. It doesn't have to add up to 250. It just could not be more than 250. So there are some abilities there for you to encourage people um, to not only get into the plan, but stay in the plan. Chuck, I don't know if you've got any other thoughts on de minimis that you want to provide. You can maybe address that and take us right into Roth employer contributions. Also. Yeah, I guess two points on that. One is because it's only allowed for people, employees who have no deferral election, if you're an employer with 98% participation, 94% participation, um, there's probably not anything that you could do today because you'd just be targeting those the 6% or 2% of employees that aren't deferring. Um, but then also just to big, piggyback off what you said, Matthew, about the being able to stagger that amount over time. So even if you have 94% or 98% eligibility, perhaps there's a way where you could structure this um, to give someone an incentive right when they're hired um, before they actually even enter the plan, and then use that staggered period as, as almost like a, a stay bonus. Um, you know, tying that in, if you know, $100 when you're first hired, and 50 year, $50 for the next, you know, three years, as long as you stay in the plan at either in the plan or at a, at a specific amount. So I think all those are are on the table with what the, the IRS has given us there. And then to slide into the, the Roth employer contributions. Um, this was actually made effective at the beginning of 2023, um, allowing employers to amend their plan to permit employees to designate either their matching contributions or profit sharing contributions coming into the plan as Roth 
However, throughout 2023, we didn't have any guidance. And so there was no way that this could actually be implemented. And thankfully in this grab bag, the IRS did uh, provide that guidance on this kind of pressing issue. Um, one of those was uh, how do you, the requirement in the SECURE Act was that all employees must be 100% vested in order to receive this Roth contribution, Roth employer contribution. Um, and that makes sense, right? Because it could be, you know, if the employee is gonna pay tax on it, you don't want it to be something that could be forfeited, like a uh, an employer matching or profit sharing contribution could be. But what we didn't know was whether that would make the employer have to make everyone 100% vested immediately if they adopted this provision. And thankfully, the IRS said no. Uh, you can actually limit the provision, this provision, to only those people who are already 100% vested. So if you've got a six-year graded vesting schedule and someone's only been there two or three years, they're not 100% vested they would not be eligible uh, for these Roth employer contributions. And then the second thing we were looking for guidance on was how it would be reported to the IRS, whether it would be on a W-2 from the employer, like your typical 401k contributions, or whether the burden would be on, on the record keeper. And, and surprisingly, um, but in hindsight, I think it makes sense, they're going, the IRS said that this would be a basically a record keeper custodial function. Um, as an employer, you report this, you do not report on the W-2, just treat it like any other employer contribution. Um, and then the employee, the, excuse me, the record keeper will in fact treat this like a conversion, like an in-plan um, conversion to Roth and issue a 1099-R. So this will relieve some of the, the burden uh, on you as, as an employer with respect to this, if you were to adopt this provision that you don't have to change anything on your systems other than on your payroll, indicating that this employer contribution is Roth instead of pre-tax. Thanks, Chuck, I think that's pretty helpful. And, and then just to, to kind of wrap up this slide in front of everybody, some good news, um, good news, cautious news for you on the, the point at the very bottom. So one of the big concerns that a lot of plan sponsors have when the law changes is, when do we need to get this amendment adopted? And thankfully, not only did Congress already give us a lot of time, but the IRS has given us even longer in the grab bag. So there's no immediate requirement that you get an amendment adopted. Now, the cautious note that we would share is that a lot of the record keepers and the document providers that you're working with are taking a bit of a, a checklist or an opt-in slash opt-out type of approach to figuring out which optional provisions you want in place. So for example, we worked with one record keeper that sent out a memo or an email to all clients and said, essentially, there's 12 optional provisions available from Secure 2.0. On three of them, we are going to assume that you wanna opt in, like moving the mandatory cash out limit from 5,000 up to 7,000 if you don't make an election. And on the other nine, we will assume you've opted out unless you wanna make an election. Every document provider record keeper is taking its own approach. Bottom line is talk to your advisor, say, hey, I wanna know exactly what's happening with all these secure 2.0 optional provisions and your advisor should be able to work you through that process. Many of you are already having those conversations. Um, I know for a fact, if you're working with Chuck or Scott or, or Mike, I know you're having those conversations, but if you're not, again, there's no huge urgency. Um, nothing to be concerned about, but I would definitely say it should be a takeaway from this conversation. Reach out to the advisor team and say, hey, we need to talk about this. Okay, so we just talked about Secure 2.0, and I just mentioned a bunch of optional provisions. I mentioned that, you know, there's some that some of the record keepers are assuming that people will want, and they're making those um, deemed elections in the absence of an employer opting out. One of the optional provisions that would be on the opposite side where not yet are a lot of record keepers promoting and pushing and encouraging this would be these pension linked emergency savings accounts. And we use that full term here because that's what the law uses. They call them uh, PLESEAs, if you will, P-L-E-S-A. Um, and I think that we wanted to distinguish between the types of emergency savings accounts that some of you had already started to put in place before Secure 2.0 and those that you might put into place specifically with the Secure 2.0 guidance in mind. And so I think, as I mentioned earlier, we wanna talk a little bit about the need for emergency savings and then help you to understand what options you might have to be able to put one of these placeas in place, 
Mike, let's go to you. Um, maybe you could share, set the table for us a little bit around the need and then drive us through how this would work. Thanks, Matthew. So what you see on the screen is a study that uh, a number of us watched. It's annually released by Bankrate and it shows the status of Americans with emergency savings. And in this case, from last year, we see that uh, approximately 22% of Americans have no emergency savings at all. So relative to the public policy piece of Secure 2.0 and Section 127, Section 127, the notion was that we wanted to try to help folks have a little bit of a cushion if they have an emergency and need cash aside from going to a credit card or heaven forbid a payday lender or something like that and so what we see with the uh the act and these provisions regarding pluses took effect as of 1-1-2024 uh, so if you want to advance the slide plan sponsors can now add to their plan a sidecar account for folks that are not hces and in 2024, that means you have to earn less than $155,000 a year. You can add a sidecar account for folks to put up to $2,500 into as an emergency savings vehicle. We'll have, I'm sure, uh, as many uh, comments here as the as the group wants to share as to the wisdom of doing this, uh, the, uh, the options, uh, the compliance need relative to the code and ERISA. But um, that's the sort of the, the background and the public policy reason for establishing it. Uh, the interesting thing is in terms of the record keepers, uh, I don't have any record keepers sort of um, highlighting this as, as available. I think um, it's kind of part of their tech stack, so to speak. And in some cases, they're gonna have a secure 2.0 release that'll make a number of things, items available. Uh, but I don't have anybody necessarily sort of pushing on this and please uh, add comments here in a minute um, as to making it available. But it did become legally available as of 1-1-2024. A few more uh, points about the details. Uh, the contributions, and again, it's a sidecar account. HCEs are not eligible to participate. Uh, they're made on an after-tax Roth basis. The matching piece is a little bit, um, uh, a little bit uh, uh, complex. So um, these dollars, are eligible for the company match under the same terms as a, same terms as other contributions by the participant. But the employer uh, piece must be put into the regular deferrals of the 401k, 403b, et cetera, um, if it's subject to ERISA. Uh, so the, there's also a cap relative to that. So the employer piece will go over to the traditional accounts uh, of the participant. The participant can make a contribution up to $2,500. And that um, limit can be either under uh, the release that we got from the IRS. And Matthew, as you know, uh, most of us on the call know at least if uh, the audience doesn't, we did get uh, guidance uh, subsequent to the grab bag in January from both IRS and DOL specific to pluses. Uh, there's two approaches that you can take relative to the amount uh, that's capped for these pluses, and it's $2,500. It can be the exclusionary approach or the inclusionary approach. If the plan sponsor opts for the exclusionary approach, then participant can contribute up to $2,500 total, and then they're capped. If it's the inclusionary approach, you have to include the earnings, and that leaves it, that's left up to the participant. So I mentioned HCEs are um, excluded, and I think, frankly, some of that technical detail that I just went through is sort of off-putting the idea that uh, folks making a little bit more money is a little bit off-putting and so that lends itself to a discussion of whether or not there are more efficient ways to do this outside of the retirement plan and i'll come to that here in, in just a minute um other things to consider um we got the notice 2024 from the irs i mentioned that we also got facts from uh, dol um mm -hmm. on the dol piece uh, one of the things, well, I'm, I'm, from both IRS and DOL, one of the things that folks were concerned about is sort of abuse and churning. And so uh, plan sponsors given some uh, choices that they can make relative to preventing that. So if you think about it, um, you could you could put money in, get the match, take money out and continue to do that and end up with an amount that's greater than the $2,500 that um, uh, the employer matches. So uh, the guidance is that that annual or that amount uh, that the employer contributes is capped at the $2,500 uh, 
Um, and then the employer is not permitted to uh, come up with a, an annual cap on top of that because they feel uh, the regulators feel that that $2,500 cap will be sufficient to prevent churning. Um, I think um, I think that kind of covers some of the detail here. Um, in terms of the record keeper's reaction, I've talked with two specifically. In both cases, they feel like um, this is an interesting thing uh, that the feds tried to do, that Congress tried to do. Uh, there are probably better solutions that they've already developed outside of uh, something that's linked to the 401k uh, retirement plan. And so one record keeper in particular went out and negotiated a deal with SoFi. Uh, you can set up with the payroll provider a direct uh, payment to SoFi, cap that at whatever amount you want. Uh, those deductions, those payroll deductions from the participant uh, don't have anything to do with the record keeper. And so you don't have to worry up about all the regulatory guidance and whether folks making more money uh, can participate or not. So um, Matthew, I think that uh, I don't wanna take up too much time on this point. I think it's important. It is legally available. We'll see what happens with the tech stack. Um, and I welcome any comments um, uh, from you guys as to what you're seeing from other record keepers, et cetera. Mike, you know, my, my takeaway from kind of tracking this process and your comments, and maybe it's some additional context for everybody, the in order to make this better for employees, Secure 2.0, imposes these requirements that employees must be allowed to take at least four withdrawals a year, the, or sorry, at least one per month, and yes. the first four in any year have to be free. So put yourself in the shoes of a record keeper and say, why, why would we put all this extra effort into developing something that we have to facilitate frequent distributions, we can't charge for them in their small amounts that are inside those. And so as a general rule across the the country, we've seen on the one hand, record keepers saying, we're not going to be quick to adopt and, and support these. On the other hand, I believe that there are other ways to try to accomplish emergency savings accounts. And what I would say to any plan sponsors listening today, um, or to any advisors listening today, make this a topic of conversation at your upcoming meeting. And don't make the topic be, hey, how do we do that thing that Mike <laughs> talked about? <laughs> Uh, because I think a lot of will say we don't want to do it exactly like that yet. But instead, what are we doing to address this pie chart? We spend all of this time focused on whether people will have enough money in 10 and 20 and 30 and 40 years. But how about the today? How are we solving for the things that stress out your employees? And as you think about those of you who are really into financial wellness, this is a key topic. And that is how do we make people feel more comfortable in the short term? And so I would just challenge everybody to be willing to have that conversation. Thanks, Matthew. Anybody summer. else? Anybody? Anybody else going to share any thoughts on emergency savings before we jump into a couple of final topics? I, I would just reiterate everything you guys have said. And as you're <laughs> trying to solve this problem, another arrow in your quiver is in the Secure Act. There is a provision allowing for a $1,000 emergency distribution from the retirement plan. Um, that you can put in and much simpler uh, to administer than than the pluses, but just some, another thing that you might want to consider as you try to solve that problem about employees not having enough emergency savings. Thanks, yeah, Chuck. That's, that's a good point. And I will will uh, add to that, uh, that the releases, the guidance, the regulatory guidance that we have says in both cases, participants will not be required to substantiate those requests for distributions. Uh, and with the emergency withdrawal, no 10% penalty either. So. Um, that might be a more uh, simplified way to uh, attack this topic. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, all right, so we have just a couple of sections left here. Um, we want to talk a little bit about these new independent contractor rules. Chuck, I think I'm going to go to you to give us just a high-level overview, um, perhaps if for no reason other than to raise some awareness with people who are listening in and may have some independent contractor situations with their organizations. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would agree with you. I think this is just an FYI um, on these in, independent contractor rules. They don't actually change anything in the retirement plan space, but just to make, especially HR directors that are they're on this call, uh, they may have seen that the Department of Labor has changed the standards for using the, changed their independent contractor rules um, under the Fair, Fair Labor Standards Act, FLSA, which is the law covering, you know, overtime and 
uh, minimum wage. And they expanded, they basically went, took off the Trump era 2021 regulations governing the independent contractors and, and widen it back up. So if you flip to the next page, you can kind of see um, what they put forth for the Department of Labor on these new rules that's on the left-hand side. And my point here is to identify that the Department of Labor governing the FLSA is different than the IRS um, interpretation of what's an independent contractor for your retirement plan. So as you work through council to um, you know, put individual employees or groups of employees in independent contractor or employee status, just make sure that you're doing that with an eye towards both sets of rules, the Department of Labor and Treasury, because it does have an impact on your retirement plan. A couple of the things on the next slide are just some bullet points about, you know, if you misidentify someone as an independent contractor for the for your retirement plan, what the implications are. Reminder, independent contractors are not eligible under your retirement plan, just employees. And that third one on there is make sure that your plan document excludes employees that are misclassified. That's someone who you identify as an independent contractor, but upon audit, the IRS says, no, no, they're an employee and they should have been eligible for your retirement plan. Well, we can solve that by, and most plan documents do, just ensure that it says anyone who is misclassified or who was misclassified is excluded, no different than any other category of employee that you could exclude on a discretionary basis. I think that's that probably sums it up, but just an FYI for every employer yeah. about they're dealing with this issue. Okay, well, thank you, Chuck. And, you know, I wanna hit on um, very quickly, on some hot topics and emerging issues. And then we'll wrap up shortly after this by just getting kind of a rapid fire around the horn approach where we can hear what's on the mind of uh, each of the rest of you here. Um, so these are three key topics that we want you to be mindful of. Uh, number one, uh, as you may recall, the Department of Labor has proposed an expansion to the definition of the word fiduciary. And in essence, what the Department of Labor wants is for when employees participants in particular, receive recommendations to take a rollover, to take a distribution, and what to do with the rollover or distribution, that that should be fiduciary advice. The Department of Labor put out the proposal, held a couple days of hearings, went through the required comment period, and is now working to finalize that rule. You will see in the next couple to few months a final rule from the Department of Labor that will expand that definition of fiduciary. We don't know how long that will last. Um, we could have a new president that would abandon that uh, sometime in, in 2025. Uh, we could have a court strike it down. So we're not going to try to predict the future as far as how long that rule might remain. But I do want to reiterate the one key point from all the Department of Labor's efforts. It views the difference between there being a fiduciary and not being a fiduciary as incredibly significant. So for those of you who are already working with the fiduciary, you know that you're doing what the Department of Labor thinks you ought to be doing. We know that when there are not fiduciaries involved, the Department of Labor thinks there is exposure to conflicted advice and perhaps inadequate advice as well. Um, secondly, we just wanna highlight some litigation developments. And you've got three bullet points in front of you. The first of those bullet points recognizes that the plaintiff's firms are getting better at their allegations regarding excessive record keeping fees. So what has happened is they're saying, hey, this plan paid too much in record keeping fees, but they weren't yet saying, hey, record keeping fees or record keeping services are kind of the same depending on where you are. I think you all know you can get better service in some places than others, but generally speaking, what is offered for those fees is relatively similar across the board. Well, some of the courts in 2022 and 2023 came in and said, you know, you, you've got to be able to show that um, somebody is overpaying for something commoditized in order for it to be expensive. But if, if record keeping expenses um, relate to very different services, then it's okay if they're 200% what they should be or 300% what they should be. So the plaintiff's firms have adjusted and now they're saying this plan paid too much for services that are quote, commoditized and fungible end quote. So just recognize that the plaintiff's firms have gotten better. And if you haven't benchmarked your record keeping for a while, that's something that we think ought to happen. Secondly, what you are doing with your forfeitures has become more and more of a critical concept. And we've talked about this, I think, in webinars over the last year and a half or so. But we want to tie a bow around where things are today. 
there's been a number of lawsuits filed frequently against very large employers saying you're not using your forfeitures in the right way. And what's interesting about this is that frequently, not every time, but frequently, the plan document says you may use forfeitures for either the reduction of plan expenses or offset against plan expenses or to reduce employer contributions. Many employers choose to reduce employer contributions and they're saying the plan document says we can do that. Well, these plaintiff's firms have said, when you chose to do that, you chose to do option B instead of option A, you exercise fiduciary discretion and that was a fiduciary breach. We don't think that those lawsuits will, will succeed, but we do have a couple of recommendations for you. Number one, Let's look at your plan document and your adoption agreement and figure out what can forfeitures be used for under the plan's terms. Number two, let's check with the record keeper and say, how are we using our forfeitures? How have we used those recently? And then number three, let's ensure that we're using them relatively soon after they arise. The guidance under the IRS proposed regulations says you should use forfeitures in the year after, by the end of the year, after the year they arise. So anything that arose last year in 2023 as a virtue of terminated employees should be used here in 2024 in general. So those are the three steps. What do the plan's terms say? Number two, how have we been using our forfeitures? And number three, how quickly are we using those up? And then finally, we talked about this during our uh, during a fiduciary 15 webinar late last year, but I wanna draw your eyes and ears back to this Nunez versus Braun case. It's really, really interesting to find a case that went to trial and to see where the court recognized that there is a reward for having a good process in place and having good minutes. This is a situation where the plaintiff said, hey, this plan was too expensive. You were paying too much for your record keeping fees. And in its opinion, the court recognized that there were 11 times in a six year period where the committee and its advisor had talked about revenue sharing and plan expenses. And they also five times in a five year period had talked about the record keeping expenses. They actually switched record keepers in the middle of that five year period. And the plaintiff said, hey, they moved record keepers. They even acknowledged that their expenses were too high. And the court said, no, they were doing what good fiduciaries do. They took a look at this pretty regularly and then they eventually made a change. So. Just recognize, you know, for those of you who work with us, for example, where, you know, we take and retain your minutes or we work with you to have really good minutes, there is a reward for having those in place. And then finally, and I won't belabor the point at the bottom, um, but this is going to be a big year for guaranteed income in plans. One of the questions that we've gotten for many of you over the last couple of years, when we talk about in-plan income and guaranteed income in plans, you'd say, great, how can we do that? And the answer to this point had been, well, we don't yet have a lot of availability, but it, we think it'll come soon. Well, this will be the year when it really starts to pop. The ability for you to say, hey, what solutions are available on the platform that are record keeper options? And we'll have answers for you. Um, I don't think it's necessarily uh, there quite yet today, nor will it be there for you next month. But when we get into about the third quarter and the fourth quarter of this year, I think many of you will be pleasantly surprised with the availability. So um, as we wrap up today, we're gonna put this up on the screen and I'm gonna ask you to pull your phones out and see whether your camera function works. And if it does, let's start on the left. We may not even need the one on the right, but we would love for you to get registered for our Qualified Plan Fiduciary Summit. Many of you have been there many times in the past. If you haven't been, I promise you, it will be a very unique retirement plan conference. This is not something that only plan sponsors go to or only record keepers or only fund people or only advisors. It's everybody together collaborating to find better solutions for participants. And so as you listen to uh, Chuck and then Mike and then Scott go around the horn with their final comments, I hope you'll take just two minutes at most and work on getting registered while we hear from them. So with that backdrop in mind, Chuck, I'll throw it over to you in like 30 seconds or so. What are the one or two things that you think fiduciaries should be thinking about most? Uh, I think this year, um, I'm going to be spending a lot of time talking with my clients about uh, financial wellness slash financial advice. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're quite a bit past uh, along that spectrum of where advisors or vendors were only providing financial 
education about the retirement plan or financial wellness. Um, and now on that journey, I think employers are becoming more and more understanding of the need to provide financial advice when it's warranted for their employees as they go down that journey and you know they get someone working with their employees for 10, 15 years and as they hit retirement, uh, they wanna make sure that there's continuity with the, uh, with the information that they're giving those participants. So a lot of discussion about um, how we can provide either income or other financial advice to participants as they're nearing retirement. Great, thanks Chuck. How about you, Mike? Uh, yeah, thanks, Matthew. I was talking with a, a record keeper that I've got a number of clients with this week, and the gentleman that I work most closely with there told me that they've seen a monumental uptick in um, uh, attacks, uh, phishing, hacking, whatever you want to call it, um, on their system. And so one of the things that I make sure I talk about with my clients relative to this RFI, et cetera, is um, making sure that a good number uh, if not 90 or 100 percent of the employees at their organization have set up their online account so they've at least established it even if they don't use it and the reason for that is if the account is is at least established it's much easier to protect than if the account for that person's not established at all hackers can uh, uh, get those credentials put together and get into uh, someone's account if the online access has not already been established and Scott well, thank you. Um, over the last six months, uh, the leading the leading question I, I get from a lot of the plans I work with is they, they are really anticipating being able to offer the employer contribution, employer match or an employer contribution as Roth dollars, as, as Chuck touched on. There was the grab bag um, guidance, which I think was very important. And so now uh, I, I just see a high level of interest in in considering that to, to make available to to their participants and and a lot of it is driven the conversations are usually driven by tenured employees and people have been in the retirement plan for a long time uh and the 401k roth feature is fairly new to them and so most of their assets really have been accumulated on the pre-tax basis and so there's a, there's a lot of interest across the spectrum i'm seeing on getting the employer Roth features uh, implemented at the various record keepers. And so that that is probably the number one thing I talk about with clients right now. Great. Well, uh, and I think the final thing I would say to everybody is I continue to believe that the safest fiduciaries are not those who are concerned about risk and defensive, but instead those who wanna be proactive and seek out solutions for your people. So if we can help in any way in that regard, we can answer any additional questions you might have you know we welcome you to reach out to us thanks again for joining us today and a big thank you to um, chuck and to scott and mike for your your thought leadership and your preparation for today um, and with that said we're going to wrap up the webinar and again invite you to reach out to us if we can help in any additional way have a great rest of your day thanks so much thanks